you're listening to The Primal Happiness Show, a podcast dedicated to helping you thrive in this crazy modern world. Every Tuesday, we explore the nature of how our minds really work, what exactly the human animal requires to thrive, and how we can live happier and more fulfilling lives. If you're new here and haven't yet taken our free class, then there's no better place to get a jump start on reclaiming your primal happiness. It's where we'll guide you step-by-step through our antidote to today's modern world. Simply head on over to primalhappiness.co slash antidote to get the free class and discover how to thrive without having to move to a planet that's not so crazy as ours. But now, your host, Leanne brooks Tyler. Hello, my beautiful people. A huge one welcome back to the show. In today's crazy modern world, men and women are living shallow, disconnected and unfulfilling lives. So we created the path for those who are ready to reclaim their wildness and actualize their deepest gifts. The next crucible we'll be opening will be Waking the Wild Sovereign in June. As ever, spaces will go fast. So if you are feeling the call to rise into sovereignty and actualize your inner king or queen archetype, then register your interest at primalhappiness.co slash WTWS and you'll be the first to know when we open for enrollment. And if you just generally want to be in our field, know what we're up to, know what we're offering, know what's coming next, then do join our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash group slash primal happiness and get our moonly newsletter, which comes out on the full and new moon, hence the name. And you can subscribe to that at primalhappiness.co slash moonly. And now into this week's show. It's with Susan Guna. Susan is a trained, somatic, trauma-informed, holistic psychotherapist with a mindful-based approach grounded in transpersonal psychology that focuses on holistic perspective through introspection, insight, and compassionate self-exploration to increase self-awareness, allowing the integration of the mind, body, and spirit aspects of the human experience in personal growth and development. In this show, we explored how Susan arrived at working with microdosing after a long experience of using traditional therapies and somatic work to heal trauma, the dangers of taking big doses of psychedelics, and how we can use microdosing in an effective and safe way. This is such a deep conversation. We went into places that are relevant and I'd say really first principles to all kinds of healing and change work. So whether you're interested in psychedelics and microdosing or not, I suspect you'll find this an enriching and insightful conversation. Let's dive in. Hello, Susan. A huge welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Lynn, for inviting me. Such a pleasure to be here. Mm, Oh, my goodness. It really is a pleasure and an honor here, too. Um, We were just chatting about how we got connected and it was through a dear friend and beloved client and uh, she was absolutely raving about you and and the work she's done with you. So I was like, oh yes, we definitely need to get Susan on the show. And I was just also saying to you, despite the fact we've done uh, several episodes over the years on kind of related topics, we've never directly spoken about microdosing um, at all, I don't think. Um, let alone the conversation we're going to be having around integration. So uh, it feels so timely. Um, so yeah, it really like the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. So I'm dying to know, and I've intentionally not asked you this until this moment. How did you come here? How did you get to the place where microdosing is your work, your passion? Yeah, it's not exactly an average thing. Even like my guests do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, but I haven't yet come across someone who is doing this as their kind of, you know, real passion. So how, what brought you here? Yeah, um, I, love, I love talking about um, the, the journey to, to this point as well. And thank you for asking this question. So my background is in psychology. Uh, ever since I was young, Um, I come from a very adverse, volatile background uh, environment. Um, 
I grew up in a very volatile, uncertain environment. So it kind of led me to ask bigger questions from very early on as a, as a kid. Um, even though I remember when I was eight, the, the first time I started pondering on religion and um, questioning religions and, and so on and so forth. And, and I thought, I look at the eight-year-olds now, and I'm thinking, wow, that was just too deep for such a young young age. And then that kind of led me to uh, discovering all kinds of, um, you know, educational material on psychology from a very young age. And I started following people in the space of psychology. Then I decided to study it. So through studying psychology, as I learned more and more about the mind and everything and trauma and how these psychological uh, issues are, you know, manifest and also how, you know, how do we heal? How do we get over our, you know, struggles, limitations? And I kind of sensed that the, the, the traditional psychology was only focusing on the mind, only focusing on the mindset and how to, you know, overcome and recover from addictions. Uh, I mean, including mental health space. If you look at the mental health space, it's, it's I know um, recently there are so many beautiful approaches are developing. But when I was studying it, it was more about talk therapy in very traditional ways. Mm. And I always sense that uh, as someone also in the field, learning about myself and doing my own work, because I obviously came to a point of realization that, oh my God, I need therapy. I need to, to overcome some of my childhood adversities. Mm. So that, that kind of helped me greatly because as I was diving into the, the materials of, you know, the traditional way, I realized something is missing. Hang on, like something is not right. Because if this was to work, I would have been in a really good space right now. And I mm. never, I never felt in a good space. I never felt safe I never felt like I was actually improving or progressing so then I came across somatic experiencing mm -hmm. the approach that looks at the body mind the spirit all in one and it's a beautiful concept that that honors the wisdom of the body and trusting the body's um, symptoms the pathological symptoms and the signs the aches the pains the chronic symptoms and I thought this is it this is the one. And then I started studying. The founder of the um, Somatic Experiencing, Dr. Peter Levin, I literally consumed all of his material and I was following everyone along those lines that were in the Somatic Experiencing. Then I came across another doctor who's in the uh, trauma-informed or trauma research study, Dr. Basil van der Kolk. Um, mm. He literally... Now, his book is just continually being the number one bestseller globally. It's incredible. Then that really opened a huge window and opportunities and understanding and grasping what really trauma and psychological symptoms all, you know, everything was just coming together, mm -hmm. missing pieces. Then as I started diving into the holistic practices of uh, psychotherapy, uh, I used to see, even though I was adding in all of these beautiful tools of the somatic experiencing, uh, such as breath work, yoga, meditation, mindfulness practices, I saw some of my clients getting better and then falling back in again, getting better. But there was a progress, then complete crush, progress, mm. complete crush. And I was thinking, hang on a minute, this is, again, I, I'm questioning what is going on here? At that point, I then came across psychedelic medicines, the infusions, the plant medicines, uh, most commonly known as ayahuasca, mescaline, uh, magic mushrooms, psilocybin, as also known as. And then I thought, okay, because I, like I said to you, uh, I'm an explorer. I love exploring uh, different tools, modalities. I'm just so curious you know, about our own psychology, the psyche and healing trauma and all of these topics are like things I talk so much about that I sometimes bore people. Like, is there any, can we talk about something else fish in my family? Sometimes we're having a <laughs> breakfast and there. Can we, to, today, like trauma word is not allowed. <laughs> so, yeah, and then, um, yeah, then I went and explored it. I, I did a deep dive in the plant medicines. 
Um, again, it's a, just trying to keep it very short here. Um, then I saw a crazy thing, Lee, and I saw that people were taking massive amounts of psychedelics and not healing, not changing. Mm. Nothing was happening. If anything, I saw something really more dangerous. I saw people actually, uh, uh, the egos were amplified um, in the psychedelic space. We call it the psychedelic narcissism. Mm. I saw the, the bypassing with psychedelic medicines was beyond I can, I can explain to you. And that really worried me and really scared. It was quite scary, actually. And then, again, started diving into, like, why is that? If these medicines are so powerful, um, I'm sure our listeners know that psychedelics are really hitting the mainstream now as a panacea. Everybody's talking about it is that one-time quick fix. Mm. You know, you sit with ayahuasca one time and you heal your past traumas, ancestral lineage, you know, all your lineage is healed, your generational trauma is healed. That's not the case. Yes, it may happen, but that's not the case. Majority of the time, it's not the case. Then I realized I got it. I thought, oh my God, I got it. It's because people are not integrating their experiences well. So they sit with this you know, ineff- you know, they have these ineffable experiences. They sit with these potent medicines only to come back to their toxic environment. And then their shadows grow, their, their limitations amplify. Their, you know, it's just almost like they hit darker points quicker mm. um, because, you know, the environment, they come back in, they, there is no support. So... And, and they go back into their old patterns immediately almost. Mm. So, so then while researching and studying all of these aspects of the medicine, the psychology, all of it to put together, now I was thinking, what's going on here? What can we bring into the space that can actually break down all of these structures and forms? And maybe like, what can we do to really help us break down these little patterns, beliefs, limitations that are all manifested through experiences, suppressed trauma, stuck energy, whatever we want to call it. In this space, we can talk about so many different things. But then I came across microdosing through, through a native shaman in the US. I saw him talk about it on social media and I started listening. And he was saying that microdosing is the one to really to to heal and he was talking about his testimonials that you know he helped people heal so many mental health issues i couldn't believe it i said this is not impossible impossible because i come from this you know this huge big background of studying every single thing and it's impossible then my curiosity got the better of me and i contacted them and i said i want to try some please guide me how I can explore this because I'm in this space where I'm just continually studying and researching new modalities and Lee and I can't tell you one cycle of microdosing changed everything for me literally turned my world upside down I saw my patterns for for real for the first Mm. time it wow. revealed mm-hmm. it revealed the way that I was bypassing the work, revealed all of my distractions, revealed my attachments. I it was so overwhelming. And and I'm thinking, wow, I, it's so overwhelming. Yet I am a professional. I know this. I know this space. This is my territory. Yet I was overwhelmed. Yet I was struggling. It was almost like meeting the the truth for the first time meeting myself for the Mm. first time so the microdosing literally ripped away all the delusional you know filters Mm. and i for the first time i saw myself it was quite painful it the process almost felt like being skinned alive Mm. i have had that image come to my mind as soon as you said that yes yeah. Mm. Then I thought, oh my goodness. If if 
coming from a professional background, if I feel this way, I can't imagine a ordinary person who who has no idea about how our psyche and you know the psyche, mm. the, the things that we know. The I know that many people are in the self development space. They have access to mindfulness practices, yoga, all kinds of things. But it wasn't enough. Mm. Then I decided this work has to be done in a safe container with other people. And that's mm. how the microdosing integration program was born. So that's oh, in a wow. nutshell. Mm. In a nutshell, that's me. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad that you, you you allowed yourself to kind of go a bit bit further with the uh, your own personal experiences and all the places that's taken you. There's so much in your journey that I also relate to. Um, yeah, wow. It's so fascinating, isn't it? How I think those of us that came into this lifetime with this sense of um, wanting to understand, wanting to be of service and how we kind of keep coming across another thing and say, this is it, this is the answer. And then we see the shadow side of that or the limitations of that. But I think there's so much of what you've said around all the different modalities and then particularly when it comes to plant medicine, it's completely matched my experience, what I've seen out there. And I guess the other thing I've really seen around the the big surge of popularity around plant medicines is there's that kind of one hit wonder experience of like, I'll have one thing and it then it will I'll be, you know, perfect, amended and everything's good. And then there's the other kind of almost like it's not seeking a high, but that kind of like keep going back and, you know, drinking as much ayahuasca as possible. Um thinking that's the answer just to keep doing that. I've also seen that happen to a lot of people in my space. And I completely agree with you. There's, it isn't enough to just have the supportive practices around that, you know, whether that be microdosing, whether that be um, continually taking bigger doses, there is something really necessary in terms of that holding. And um, I think that's that's actually true for a lot of um, sort of deep initiations. Um, I see that in uh, I'm training in shamanism. And in that, I really see how when we're going through a big initiation, having that holding before, during and after is essential, absolutely essential. And um, it kind of blows my mind that it isn't out there in the world in the way that it's needed. So I'm so delighted we're having this conversation. I think it's it's so, so needed. So um, where, do, where to start from here? So I think what would be really helpful, you've touched at a kind of um, a, a high level with the um, benefits of microdosing. I would love to spend a little bit of time understanding, I guess, you know, what do you see is happening? What, what's the science say? What's your personal experience say? You know, why is that creating this kind of being skinned alive, revealing all of our patterns? What's going on there? Um, I guess that that would be the place I'd like to start, just understanding more about the power of microdosing. Yeah, great question. Um, so the science, so, you know, as in the West, we, you know, we value science so much, which I do as well, because without science, you know, we couldn't study all those things. And so the science says that um, the psychedelic medicines, they kind of create entropy. And in many, um, you know, esoteric or non-esoteric processes of any kind of progress or in, in our evolutionary progress, I think, Entropy plays a massive role in terms of coming and rapturing everything. So for me, uh, psychedelic medicines do just that on whether it's a bigger or whether it's a microdosing, a micro micro, even even as uh, there is a, a mini mini micro, like it goes into a tiny micro where not about uh, feeling the effects, not getting high or going into non ordinary states, as Dr. Stan Grof would say. Lots of people would say altered states, but he believes it is not the altered states. We go into a non-ordinary state. So I'm tying that in with the science, and science says it creates entropy, which means 
it literally takes uh, uh, all of our uh, chemical, uh, you know, composition of our mind and the way everything is set in, set in stone and, and the way that we are wired. And it comes in and it kind of just messes it all up. Imagine like uh, if you was to create a beautiful, uh, put together a beautiful uh, puzzle together and psychedelic medicines, they come in, they just go... Mm. that's what it does to our mind Mm -hmm. and and this is so beautiful because if you look at like shamanism is a great example to kind of tie in together because that's what the the space holder or the shaman or the facilitator does they come in and they literally rupture or or create entropy within those individuals uh, when they hold space, so that now when we are ent- when we enter into that entropy or in that state, all of our structures fall away. Everything we know to be true falls away. Everything we've you know are our, our known, let's call it our known, is disrupted. Mm. Now from that place, we have. I always say we are the AI. We carry such phenomenal intelligence, the mind, the body. Now, that opening is enough for our incredible, you know, wise body and mind to recreate and restructure things and rebalance things and find flow and find the the balance better. This is what the medicines do even the microdosing. So they come in, they come in, they rupture everything, disrupt everything. And then we are now thrown into the unknown a little bit. So in that window, then we have a, a choice or, or, or opportunity to grow from there and really make a huge steps in progressing, healing um, or entering into flow states, uh, whatever the, the need uh, for the individual. Because everybody comes to the medicines with different intention. Not everybody comes into the medicine space with uh, intention of healing trauma. It could be just wanting to build confidence or just wanting focus or clarity or some maybe answers uh, going forward in their life and their life decisions. So everybody has their own intentions to come. But the, the, the brilliant thing is that they will do exactly what the person needs in mm. that moment. Mm-hmm. And not necessarily <clears throat> what the person thought they needed. Exactly. So mm. these medicines, somehow, there is a greater intelligence. Um, you know, we believe that the medicines are sentient. So there mm. is a greater intelligence that when they come in touch or contact with our intelligence as the AI that we are, something incredible happens beyond our comprehension. And because of the legal landscape of the medicines, unfortunately, we're so behind in research. It's actually quite mm. shame. It's such a shame that um, we're planning to travel to, to Mars in a few years, yet we kind of put these under the carpet and not really studied. Imagine all those years. We've got the technology now. We have everything that we could bring out some incredible studies, but yet we didn't do it. But now we are doing it, which is great, saying that we are now on this because a lot of the um, organizations, there's so much going on right now in the world, and they call it the uh, psychedelic renaissance is happening because we have um, amazing investors really investing now into the studies. Great, great news. So... I'm actually excited to find out what happens in the next five years, maybe even two years. I think we're going to have at mm. least a good understanding of what they are. But for it, my own experience, this is what they are. Simple, simple way to explain is they come in and they disrupt the known. Now you are left with to recreate something that's more in balance and aligned. Mm. Um, so that's why the container. So with the microdosing, when we go through such a, a process, it is, it is so big that we should never take it lightly. You know, having our 
known, you know, disrupted and ruptured. It is not something very, it is not something that we should just think, oh, it's just another tool, another something that we use. It's not, it's not like that at all. Even meditation, you know, some people th uh, think of meditation as, oh, it's just a practice I do every day. No, it's not. It's, it's big. It's huge. It's a big deal. If you was to meditate consistently for a year, you, you will literally be another person. You know, the progress is so huge. So I see that the medicines are the same, especially microdosing. A one cycle of microdosing would be six weeks, uh, which is based on Dr. James Fadiman's. Uh, that's what he proposed because he is the guy behind the microdosing movement that probably mm -hmm. started around nearly a decade ago now. And, you know, a six week cycle of microdosing is, is, is perfect to really allow that, that disruption to come, come in and, and then, um, allowing ourselves to rebuild everything from that. But then the container that comes with it is huge because when we are doing this in our own usual ordinary environment, at some point, you know, our bodies are so adaptive, it will suppress. You won't allow mm -hmm. the medicine to work. You won't allow yourself to go through that disruption you won't allow yourself to you know go through the process the microdosing needs to take you through because we have the ability to resist block and suppress anything that comes from the outside mm. yes it's not like we're wired to say oh yes change and disruption goody yeah. it's the opposite <laughs> yes <laughs> very very well said mm. wonderful so just before we talk about kind of what what's needed what's it needed to be put in place to allow for that kind of healthy integration um just talking about the i guess those patterns that are being revealed you've mentioned uh trauma already and how your family <laughs> ban you from saying it but let, let's go there are you seeing that um you know most all uh, you know some of those patterns are created by trauma like what are that what create puts those patterns in place in in the system in the first place yeah so let's talk about the somatic experiencing in this uh, uh for this uh, question now i think it's a great time to bring in the somatic so what i understand with the microdosing Let's um, put aside all of the big experiences, you know, the ayahuasca and, and other, other big, big, big doses and other experiences, the ritualistic ones. Um, I just want to here just really focus on the microdosing. Um, for our listeners, if you guys never heard of the microdosing, it's literally a tiny, tiny amount of uh, psychedelic medicine you take uh, only twice a week, by the way. It's not something you take every day either. Because again, our body is so intelligent, it will start to build tolerance. So you, you won't then have, you know, receive any benefits at all. Mm. So it is something you don't take every day. It's something that you could take maybe two times a week, the max. Um, imagine a tiny dose. So, um, so um, coming back to the somatic experiencing, what happens is that I also follow, after studying somatic experiencing for so long and our early developmental traumas and environment, I then discovered Dr. Stan Groff's work, which he talks about the perinatal trauma. Mm -hmm. he, talks about, he talks about some incredible stuff around the, 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 the um, clinical birthing actually being the ultimate trauma for the baby. Mm -hmm. Um, and he says, it's not even that it actually starts in utero. It's like goes beyond the birthing, the clinical birthing process. And he says that the, the birthing process is actually the biggest assault on the baby. Wow. Because some, yeah, mm -hmm. some babies, you know, they, they get stuck in the birthing canal or they get, you know, they get pulled out or, or um, cesarean or all kinds of complications. Uh, sometimes babies um, have the umbilical cord around their neck or, you know, all kinds of compli complications. And he believes that the trauma actually starts right there, mm. if not before, because um, mothers are so sacred and important during the pregnancy. And if they are 
<clears throat> in an environment where it's um, uncertain, violent, they're in toxic partnership uh, relationship uh, or adversity um, is that's where actually the trauma begins. He he proposes that's where it begins because during his um, psychedelic assisted therapies, <clears throat> thousands of times he it was it was so evident <clears throat> in his work that people would directly go there. Mm. They will go to the utero. They will go to the birthing, initial birth. They would remember things that, uh, the, you know, they, they shouldn't have, none of us should have remembered. And <clears throat> there was one case that I was fascinated when he said <clears throat> a lady would, would hear things uh, during, you know, in the womb. There were very clear words. And during the therapy session with psychedelic medicine, she remembered everything. And she went and confronted the mother and her mother couldn't believe there was no way she could have accessed this information. Wow. So, so yeah. So she was um, in a very toxic relationship and there was a lot of violent arguments during her pregnancy. Mm. That traumatized, yes. traumatized the baby. Mm. <clears throat> so then let's pick it up from there. And the perinatal trauma is huge uh the clinical uh, birthing process that creates all those trauma dr stan you know he pro proposes that that defines the the traumas of the latest stage so mm -hmm. in a in a way he says for example there's one example that moves me so much he said if a baby was stuck in a birthing canal and stopped breathing for a moment and they will become adults forever suffering from anxiety mm. from that one moment of, you know, mm. all these things. And then uh, that will become their blueprint that will then manifest events, relationships, situations that would then support that initial uh, trauma and continually manifest events, mm. situations that would continually be the extension of what the baby experienced during the perinatal process yeah that really makes sense mm -hmm. but then, and i think yeah. it feels helpful to say and that can be addressed you know hence why we're having this conversation about microdosing yeah exactly <laughs> yes. and then of, and of course there is a whole world of the early trauma right the childhood mm. trauma that every single one of us you know we're not um we, uh, you know one of my phrases that uh, sometimes not received really well that we are all trauma survivors, whether we accept it or not, because mm. trauma is not actually what happens outside of us, but what happens inside of us, the, you know, how we perceive it within us. <clears throat> Again, this comes back to Dr. Basil's work. He said uh, there would be a child in Syria, um, you know, seeing his house blown apart and, and mother dying or something like that, and he will suffer tremendously from PTSD and many other uh, you know, um, mental disorders. Yet another child in the Western world, in a comfortable house, secure, great parents, mm -hmm. and he will lose his favorite toy. And he will go through the same mm -hmm. PTSD, the anxiety, the trauma. And I think this is um, it's also to bring in the fact that it's not that it's, uh, my sense is that it's kind of natural to humans to have this deeply traumatic childhood. It feels to me that a lot of that is the product of the world that we're living in isn't conducive to humans being kind of, as you say, created in the womb, being birthed in a way that's supportive of them being this kind of thriving uh, human and then just the disconnected way we're living in. And so I really agree. And I think that's so, it's so the water we're swimming in is so easy yeah. to miss and the impact yeah. that's having. Exactly. And then mm. we can take this then to um, why we have all these patterns, why we suffer from uh, self-loathing and, um, you know, lack of self-confidence, uh, self-esteem and, you know, imposter syndrome. I know amazing people in the space of healing or, you know, leadership and they suffer tremendously from imposter syndrome that they're not good at it or, or they, they just they feel like a fraud. Uh, there are so many gifted people literally wasting their lives just 
so buried in their mm-hmm. limitations and and these are you know from my understanding maybe possibly from all of those traumas that we live so when we begin the microdosing process they come up in small mm-hmm. incre- incremental insights these limiting beliefs they start to get louder it's almost like the microdosing process kind of switches light spotlight on those mm-hmm. things that we carry but mostly um, because of the adaptation so talking about adaptations would be so helpful because even though we carry so much trauma we become so good at functioning in the world mm. developing so many adaptations that could literally help us navigate through anything and everything and and they mm. become these adaptations they become so strong and wired in in that it, it it's almost impossible to break them down through talking therapy or anything else it needs to be felt so so what i always say uh, through the integration process of microdosing is that we need to induce another uh, uh, trauma within meaning mm-hmm. we need to that's the entropy part because the microdosing already provides the destruction so creates that outlet so what we do is we use that outlet then to allow ourselves to be in that fire feel really bad and really immerse and sit with all the pain all of the things that surface which is not common by the way in the um, self-development space where it's kind of we've been sold to believe that healing comes easy and we can Mm. change change your mindset change your life which is true to a degree but if somebody is greatly suffering and they have developed you know tremendous pathological symptoms you cannot tell that person to change their mind to change their life it's impossible Mm -hmm. they need to yeah Mm -hmm. they need to they need to build inner capacity in order so Mm -hmm. what one of the the beautiful things that microdosing does is helps us build inner capacity slowly without us realizing so by the end of your cycle you won't believe how much courage you develop that now you feel like you can have that difficult conversation with that person that you can now uh, you know take action on that decision that you've been procrastinating on or you can now you know you know when um one of the the most popular ones uh people move countries when they microdose (laughs) <laughs> they, they now suddenly feel like they can do it and they've been wanting this for so long they could never bring themselves to do it one i remember one cycle of um uh the the program a lady said i'm gonna sell my business and this was like a 30 year year <laughs> massively successful business and i was saying please don't make decisions like radical decisions while you're microdosing at least wait um for a while at least really kind of you know reflect on it if it's the right decision but she was like no 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 i'm 100 percent. this is the right thing <laughs> so it kind of gives that mm-hmm. level of clarity and helps you move forward yeah wow yes yes so uh, this is this is such a wonderful conversation but we're fast at coming to the end of the show and i really want to get into um what for you does good integration look like? What's required in that container? Yeah. So integration, I'm a huge believer in communities. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think this pandemic has also proved to us and shown us that we need to come together. I yes. think um, we are socially wired. And especially the healing work or trauma work, we cannot mm-hmm. do alone. We definitely need a container. So, and I look at my own experiences in the past and I think, wow, all of my biggest breakthroughs always came through when I was in a safe container with other people doing yes. similar things, mm-hmm. right? So that's I love it. I- Can I just say, I love that you're saying this because over the years, um, Jonathan, the co-founder of Primal Happiness and I kept noticing like that's the ingredient that is so often missing in... Yeah you know, all kinds of work, change work, healing work. And mm-hmm. 
for that reason, we are now including some form of circle in all the work we do, because it just seems that that's the ingredient that allows, you know, that real potency of change to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it makes so much sense when you consider like that's our natural environment. Why would that not be needed here when mm -hmm. it's the, you know, the most challenging experiences most of us will have? So I love that you said that. Yeah, community is number one. My my mm. highest, highest priority in anything I create. I love creating, you know, um, at a time when the pandemic kicked off, um, I was finding uh, immense uh, value in just meditating daily. And I thought, we need to do this together with other people. Like, if I can, uh, you know, be calm in this crazy pandemic uh, unfolding, then I need to, I need to, we need to stick together. So I created this Facebook group and I launched this 21 day meditation challenge and I said, come and sit with me. And I would just literally um, launch, a, launch the Zoom and then, sorry, um, I just uh, distracted there. So I would just literally, okay. literally is like, um, I would literally just uh, launch the Zoom link and everybody would just jump in and we'll just sit there, sit there meditating 20 minutes, closing our eyes, just connecting through the heart. It's like, wow, what a beautiful thing to do. Then this is what communities are needed. This is why we need to come together. And this is why we need to, you know, really sit together and witness each other. Right. So that's the number one. And the second one is have a, amazing super powerful tool that works for you i i don't recommend microdosing to everybody because it's not for everybody but if it is then you, this is your tool so find something it could even be a meditation practice it could even be yoga practice it could even be something else right i always say find a super powerful tool that really works with you and the other one is sit with everything that comes up. Do not run away. Try to dip your toes into, into that, you know, in, in those waters where usually you would find yourself distract, run away, you know, mm -hmm. all those kind of things that we do, escape. But build, slowly build capacity because we need to self-regulate. We need to learn to self-regulate. Also you know, uh, have a community to also help us co-regulate. So we co-regulate to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. So just that reciprocation of uh, being in a container, in a group community, and then with a powerful tool, then you yourself allowing yourself to really sit, to feel some of those most uncomfortable feelings. You don't have, you don't have to intellectualize it. You don't have to reason with it. You don't have to do anything. If you can just sit with it for two minutes a day, as they arise, because with the microdose, especially with the microdosing cycle, they arise daily. And mm -hmm. usual, usually people would kind of try and distract, escape. And I always say, just sit with it. Like don't mm -hmm. don't look in the manual why. Just 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 breathe through it. Just sit in mm -hmm. that fire for a couple of minutes and then see where it takes you. Mm -hmm. These are my my ideal three ingredients. Wonderful. Mm. So is there anything is there anything else that you feel would be helpful for someone listening that either perhaps has um, already explored microdosing but perhaps hasn't been aware of some of the aspects you've spoken about that uh, you see are, are important or perhaps someone that's brand new to it and has heard something in what you're saying is like oh goody you know like this feels like it could be for me is there anything else that you feel would be helpful for them to know yeah, so the microdosing, um, like I said earlier, it's not for everybody. And a lot of people talk to me about, you know, they had experienced microdosing, they use microdosing, they are actually, I even had conversations with people who've been on um, microdosing for a year, and they said, oh, none of those things, like, happened to me. And, and I always say, because you are not in a safe container. So if you're mm. going to, if you're ever going to explore microdosing, please find yourself a, either a really good community there are uh, people are really doing this together 
or a really amazing facilitator who has been through these uh, you know, processes that can literally hold you, mm. can literally guide you through. Because one of the, the most um, instant and the most quickest thing that we do when the emotions arise through that opening, through microdosing, you would go out and distract it. You go and have a little drink, you go and do a little, you know, you go, and go on a shopping spree or, you know, all these patterns will come and you, it's hard for us to know that, oh my God, you know, we don't sit there and think, oh, I'm distracting myself now. Mm. No, we don't. But, if, <laughs> but, but if you mm. kind of work with somebody who's gone through the process that knows these steps, mm. they can say to you, no. Yeah. <laughs> sit with it and then let's talk. I will sit with you. Like, we've got such a beautiful community. And when somebody, you know, has to face those arising emotions, the discomfort, you know, that, that discomfort, um, I encourage them to come and share it in the group. So if, if, if one participant shares something like that, guess what? Everybody jumps in and says, we're here, we're sitting with you through this mm, fire. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. just incredible. So this, this is something I would definitely recommend, um, especially those who are called to exploring, but they kind of not know where to start and how to really feel the, or receive the most benefits. Mm. Always find the others that's gone through it authentically. Yeah. yeah? Mm. Yes. The, uh, find the others that, uh, that quote has come up a lot in the last month. I think it's a really good advice for this in particular. Thank you so much. So if listeners would like to find out more about you and the amazing work you're doing and what you're offering, where's the best place for all of that? So the website is psychedelicconversations.com. Mm -hmm. uh, here I have uh, also, uh, I interview people here in the space. I sit down with people. Uh, purely the intention is to, um, you know, put out as much content on education on this uh, super powerful medicines. I really want us to, you know, understand or grasp what they are and, you know, how they can help us, how they can um, also like, um, catch those you know things and demystify some of those mainstream um material that a lot of people kind of fall into and these are traps so my job is to really bring a lot of education and, and a lot of understanding what they are and how can they be kind of um put together or maybe tie in together with other tools mindfulness tools therapeutic tools so that we can really receive the best out of them and completely stay away from the recreational or because easily can be abused, easily can be used for escapism. Mm. We don't want to do that. We really want to honor them. We really want to use them authentically. And we really want to do this with people who, I mean, you can, we always say, you know, sometimes I get people saying, oh, I, I sat with somebody that was really, didn't realize at first, but they were really not the person that I wanted to work with, I always say, I'm sure in the beginning when you meet a facilitator, you must have had a feeling about them. Mm. But we oftentimes we kind of suppress that and like don't listen to our gut feeling. So screening, you know, how people are using authentically, just go with that is super important. Mm. So um, I'm planning to also, um, you know, put other links where people can find really authentic, uh, you know, communities that they can get support and help and learn and educate on this. So psychedelicconversations.com would be the one to visit. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much, Susan. This has been um, such a rich conversation and I absolutely honour you for the work you're doing in the world. So needed. I mean, it really is the medicine the world needs. So thank you. Thank you so much, Liam. This is such an amazing conversation. Also, I love these conversations and um, you know, we need to have more of this. I am aware that we mm. need to really start speaking more and spread the word so that people can make informed decisions. And yeah, the idea is to, you know, take that, uh, you know, autonomy back and, and, and you really grow in self-agency. That's my highest value. That we really need to grow in more self-agency as mm. a collective. So it's a good time. Thank you so much for hosting me. Oh, thank you. Oh my goodness, what a delicious episode. Here are my takeaways. 
So many of our unwanted patterns are due to trauma, which most forms of healing work we try, especially if they only deal with the mind, don't really address. This is often what brings people to psychedelics and plant medicine. They create entropy that allows them to reach the parts that not everything else can. The challenge with this approach, though, is people taking massive amounts of psychedelic medicines and not seeming to change or heal. But if anything, egos can become amplified and more bypassing occurs. Susan deemed this psychedelic narcissism. People have these ineffable experiences as they sit with these potent medicines to only come back to their toxic environment and then dive straight back into their old patterns. The power of microdosing is that we can create the journey in a way that allows for the rupture and the breaking down of old patterns and contains ongoing holding with an intentional community support, guidance and integration. If you'd like to get the notes, including details of Susan's work, do hop on over to our show notes and they're at primalhappiness.co slash episode 360. And if you don't want to miss out on next week's episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher or your app of choice and hit that subscribe button. That way you'll get each episode delivered automatically straight to your device as soon as it comes out. Thank you so much for listening. You've been wonderful. Catch you again next Tuesday.